Well, all kinds, just as cities have things that they are known for, churches also have things that they are known for. As Dr. Scott Jones spoke this morning, he said that we are part of the Wisconsin Fellowship of Baptist Churches, the WFBC. It's not that there's an overhead organization over all these churches, but each one of these churches is independent, but yet the WFBC exists to help encourage one another to help encourage those who have needs and there are all different kinds of churches out there yes but the kind of church we belong to is an independent church and it has things that it is known for hallmarks that are unique to that church and yet every single church every single believer around the world should have these character traits portrayed here in First Thessalonians, what a church should look like, what it, how it ought to behave. So we're going to go through these marks of an established church. I've already preached three parts to this sermon series, but now go ahead and look at First. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read the verses. It says to the churches, be followers of us, imitators of the Lord, as you have received the word in much affliction and suffering. And verse 7, so that you became an example to all of those throughout Macedonia and in Achaia. And verse 8, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception that we had from you. And how you turned from God, from idols to God to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Father, I pray now for the preaching this morning. I pray that you would open our hearts, that we may look deeply, reflectively, that we would repent today and turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to just review briefly the first six marks of an established church you see on the sermon outline today we start with number seven so these marks of an established church one that is rooted in christ the first mark is that it is a praying church this church needs to be a praying church on wednesday nights we have a prayer time that starts at seven o'clock and everyone is welcome to come to that a time of prayer we begin with that at seven we take some time to share prayer needs I would encourage you to come at like 650 so that you can start putting down your prayer requests and talk about those and then at like 7 15 or so we gather into our groups and we pray we have a men's group and a women's group that prays together and then we have a short teaching time but not only on Wednesday, that's not the only time that you can pray, but you yourselves can pray to God the rest of the week. And prayer does not have to be a certain posture. You know, we often see a picture of someone on his or her knees with their hands clasped. That's not how you have to pray, but yet prayer is an important part. So first of all, I said, so then it said the second mark is that you live godly that you live godly in faith and how you live godly that is an identifying mark of the church when people come together that's great when you come to church that's a wonderful thing there's nothing wrong with that but if you spend the rest of the week living like the devil that's not living godly what you do at home throughout the week is exactly what you should look like on Sunday morning at church. You don't come with a cleaned up appearance on Sunday morning. What you are like during the whole week should match a godly lifestyle. 
you can say, yes, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he changes my life, but then you don't act like it. That's, that doesn't go together. Thirdly, those who are in church are saved. Now, does that mean that everyone who comes to church is saved? No. Jesus told a story that said, the kingdom of heaven looks like a farmer sowing his seed. And he went out and he sowed his seed. And then at nighttime, an enemy came along and threw out some tares. That means like weeds, things that don't belong in the field. He threw out a wrong kind of seed. And as these plants began to grow and come up, the servant said, there's, you know, tares mixed in with our wheat. What are we going to do about this? And the farmer said, just let them grow up both together, and then it will be obvious which one is wheat and which one is the weed when they are fully grown. And then when we gather them, we will gather up all of the weeds, and we will bind them, and we will burn them, but the wheat will be gathered into my barns and stored. And Jesus told that story as a picture of the kingdom. Not everyone who claims to be a Christian, not everyone who goes to church is actually saved. I believe that there are probably some weeds here, people who are not actually saved, but they come to church. If you aren't saved, take care of that today. So the Thessalonians also, the mark of an established church is that they have the true gospel. Paul explained the gospel to this church. Many people were saved because they received the true gospel through the Holy Spirit. And then also those who received this true gospel, they became genuine followers of the Lord. And that's what I preached last week, that you know how children imitate their fathers or their parents. Children are imitators. And in the same way, those of you who are saved Paul says, you need to become an imitator of us. Speaking of himself and Silas and Timothy, because we imitate the Lord. So imitate. Genuine followers, followers of the Lord should imitate their leaders. You know, I, I realize I am not perfect, but if there are good character traits, to exhibit Christ-likeness, it is okay to copy those traits. And of course, we know that Christ is our best example. Now, remember this word is not preserved, but it means to persevere, to continue on through problems, through trials, frustrations, you continue on for Christ. And that is where I ended last week, and I didn't have a chance to get through that whole point last week. So that's where we'll continue on and pick up here with point number seven, the word to be an example to the other churches. In verse seven, it says, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe to all the other believers in these two areas, Macedonia and Achaia. And I'll show you a map here. Last week I showed you this image, but I'll show it again. Do you remember what they're doing here? What are they doing? They're making coins. Now today, the Fed is the Federal Reserve is responsible for making the coins and you know it's just a machine that does it we have such wonderful technology but this would have been an old way of making coins that you had to have a mold to copy not a I'm not talking about green mold that grows on your food but a mold would be like a die or a metal design and this mold has to be made in the opposite manner you know like in a mirror when you look at the mirror and you see a reflected image. So a mold will be, or a die will be designed. And then what is stamped on it will be the reflection of that mold. And you've seen how there are always figureheads imprinted on a coin. So 
this here would be one person holding the metal in place above that mold or that die and another person hammering it on there so that the image is imprinted onto the coin. And this imprint, we are to live in such a way that other churches can copy us, can imitate us. Do you understand what I mean here? Do you want other churches to copy us how we are right now? And if not, you better make some changes for the better so that you can be an example. You are to leave a mark, an imprint on other churches. You can see on the map here, you can see the map here of Achaia, the green on the map in the south. Oh, it seems that Bethany's coughing. I wasn't sure what was going on. Okay, anyway, um, so you see on the bottom, on the south southern part of the map, you have Macedonia, and this is the area that Paul is speaking about, thus you know, this church is an example for other churches in the area. And as Paul traveled, he would tell others to look at the church in Thessalonica, to learn from them because they follow the Lord. And that's the best. If people come visit at EDBC and we hope that they come and say, wow, they are imitating Christ. And they have people here who love the Lord. That would be the best review rather than saying, oh, they gossip here, they backstab, they have conflict. Don't come to that church because it'll mess up with your life. No, we want to be a church that follows the Lord. That's the best, right? We should love God's word. And my point is, it's not important what people think of you. We live for the Lord, but that would influence what others think. If I conform to what people think, you will always fail. You need to follow the Lord, and naturally, your example will spread to other churches. And there are two specific examples that we're going to talk about today from this church, from Thessalonica, two different examples. The first example is how they gave generously. And what does that mean to give generously? It does not mean to be stingy with your money, but to give, to support God's work in the local church, to support other people, to give generously. And I'm going to read the verse to you said, moreover, brethren, speaking of the churches of Macedonia, Paul said, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded. And abounded means plentiful in the riches of their liberality. And that word liberality, and that word liberal, we think that it means an open-minded person, somebody who might support LGBTQ issues. But that is not what that word means here. It means freely, like liberty. It means freedom, liberty. And then liberality, it means without limit. So this means that that church was known for being very poor and to have 
trials and affliction, but their joy was abundant. And they gave freely. Doesn't mean free as in the amount, but they gave in abundance. And further it says, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. And what is that word? Willing. So when another church said that they needed help, this church was willing. They did what they could, and they abounded in what they could do. Let me give you an example here. Let's say you earn like $6,000 or $2,000 a month. Let's say you earn $2,000 a month, right? And you have the ability to give $200. Why would I say 200? Well, that's 10%, right? That is what the Bible recommends is 10%. And so then you would live on 1,800, right? You give according to your ability. Now this says here that they gave beyond their ability, right? No, it doesn't give us a specific number what we're supposed to give. If you earn $500 a month, you can give your ability, you know, $50. Or if you feel like you could give more, you could give more. So, but I'm not going to say that $200 is better than giving $50. That is not how God thinks about that. That is not how God thinks. That is how we think, though, sometimes, isn't it? So it is important that we give what we can. And then more is called giving by faith, right? When we support our missionaries here in our church, we support them by faith. We have our regular tithes that we give to the church, but if we feel like we can give more and I'm going to trust God to provide for my needs and I'm going to give beyond that for supporting the missionaries, that's what we call our faith promise. Do you have enough faith to trust God in your giving? Do you understand what I mean? And this church was facing deep poverty. Let me look here again at the verse that says that their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Paul didn't mean that they gave, that what they gave their, you know, they didn't give a lot and so therefore they weren't as worthy. No, he said they knew they had a bad economy situation. Their church was facing very financial difficulties and yet they gave, they gave more than they possibly could have. You know, this church went through some severe financial struggles. So I moved here in 2008, and then shortly after, shortly after, there was a great recession, right? We called that a recession. Do you remember that a lot of houses were being sold and foreclosed, and there was, a, the economy was just, in dire straits. Do you remember that? Well, that was the year 2008. And I remember that there were, the government was trying to give bailouts to different companies to keep them afloat. And we'd say, well, that wasn't too bad. We still had money. But then as we started getting our building put together here, then there was Hurricane Katrina and that affected a lot of supplies. That was a trickle down effect. And so a lot of building materials, the cost rose. And I believe that we had a loan for $400,000, but then we ended up needing, it ended up needing to cost $800,000 to build this. 
And so we, by faith, we're giving for that. You know, the economy cycles usually hit the east and the west coasts first, and then it trickles down towards the middle, the Midwest. But I remember that in 2009, 2010, people were losing their jobs. They had to find different housing and they had to move on for other opportunities. There was nothing, you know, that I'm upset about that, but there were many people who had to leave this church and we cut costs as much as possible. And we still, we didn't have much at all. And we spent, we even had a day of prayer, of fasting, so that we could know what to do with our finances. And God saw through that and he continued to bless and he provided for us. But would we say, no, we're gonna not support our missionaries anymore because we have to take care of our needs right here. No, we still provided for our missionaries. We still provided, we never had to reduce the support of our missionaries. I've been here for 18 years and we've never had to reduce their support. Can you imagine that? God blesses. My dad would always tell me that when you give, God will always give back in return. As you give it out, God will provide and he will give it right back to you. But if you stop giving, is there any reason for God to keep providing for you? No, that would be selfish. So this church in Thessalonians was an example to other churches in their generosity. <clears throat> they said, I beg you with much urgency, please receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. Then they gave to us according to the will of God. So in order, so in other words, they were able to give generously because first of all, they gave themselves to the Lord. They knew their life belonged to the Lord. They surrendered themselves to him and that enabled them to give to others. Isn't that great? <clears throat> we just had our offering when I give my offering, my check that I put in the offering, that is an act of praise to God that I am able to give to God and God will use that to bless others. Think that way. It's not about, oh, well, the church makes me give and so I have to like give a little bit, you know, because it's just what I'm supposed to do and man, I wish it, you know. I wish I didn't have to help Brian Levens live. No. Thank God that he has given you what you need. What about people who don't have any income? And what do they do? Well, find a job. You know, if you find a way to help. There are other verses here that say, don't be lazy, but get out. Give. Get out get a job, get your work so that you can have to help other people who need. So, yeah, that that's, it encourages you to get a job. What if you're in prison? Well, that's a different scenario that what can you do? What are you able to do? You know, this is according to your ability. What can you do to worship and help? Now, Think back then, you know, here in America, our ec economic system is not as it was when we're talking about here in Israel. This was an agrarian society. And so the church would be kind of maybe out in the country, perhaps. You know, this church here used to be out in the country. Do you think people gave their money to church? Maybe not as easily. You know, we didn't have as much. Today we have cash and banks all around. And so maybe often they would give food for the church to continue in operation. What can you do? We live in a cash-based economy, right? <laughs> Credit-based economy, really. Um, 
but that's how we live today. So when farmers grow food, they don't grow food for themselves, they grow it to sell, right? That would be different. It used to be that if I had a farm, I would plant it mainly for my family and my needs. And, you know, I'd get my cabbage and my green beans and all my different vegetables out there. And then if there was extra, I would sell it. And then I could give of my bounty to support the church. But thank you for asking that. It's an important question. What can you do? How can you give? Now, other specific examples of their generosity, we have also their endurance and faith. We see their example of their endurance and faith. So let's look at these verses here. First Thessalonians in, that was the first letter to the church, and this is in second Thessalonians here. It says, we are bound, thank God always for your brethren, as it is right or fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. So that we, ourselves, Paul says, we tell other churches about you. That we boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions. That your patience here means your endurance and the faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Paul saw that church and what they were going through and he said wow they are a great example of faith and endurance even though they're suffering persecution and they're suffering trials they still hold on to their faith wouldn't that be awesome if that was said of us you know how do you know if a ship is sinking how would you know you have to watch the rats, right? They run away. If a ship is sinking, you watch the rats. They all run away. They're the first ones to try to get off the boat. They try to get out of there. And that's a sign that the ship is sinking. Don't be like a rat. Don't run away at the first sign of trouble and then you give up and you're like, nope, I'm out of here. I'm not doing this anymore. Don't be that way. Be strong. Have faith in God. I thank the Lord that I live in the United States of America where we have the freedom of religion, right? If that were ever removed, then what would you do? Would you scatter or would you still be faithful to the Lord? Don't be afraid. Yes, of course, it's scary. Yes, absolutely. We don't desire that persecution. But yet, have faith. Trust the Lord. He is with you. Jesus said, be afraid of him who can hurt both your body and soul. Don't fear those who can only hurt your body. Trust him. If persecution were ever to come to America, persevere. If something goes wrong with the church, something happens, you know, maybe the hearing church has to close and we'll always say, well, that's it for the deaf ministry. That's it. We're over with. I'll stay home. No. No. Find another church that preaches God's word. Don't stop. Keep going. Persevere for the Lord. So this Thessalonian church was an example in their generous giving and their faith and endurance through persecution. Now, number eight, the eighth mark, echo, echo. Why do I say the word echo? You know, that's, what is an echo? Uh, not, it, like, let's say if I could go in a building and I could yell against the wall, the sound would reflect outward and bounce against all the walls in uh, Cincinnati. 
Ohio. That's where I lived for a little while. Our our school took a field trip to a museum. And do you remember the railroad museum there, Heather, with the big... That was a museum, right? And it had a big archway there. And I remember I went in there. Now, again, we are deaf students, right? So we were a deaf class and the teacher was there and, you know, all of us little kids with our giant hearing aids and the boxes on our chest and all that. And we went in and we're like, wow, this is beautiful looking at this huge museum with the big columns that stretched up into the sky and the archway. And then it also had some uh, waves to the ceiling and the teacher said come on keep going come along and the teacher you know we're all following along like little ducks behind their mother and uh, the hearing people said no you need to go stand over there and so someone yelled into the wall and you know it was a woman's voice so someone yelled into the wall and that sound traveled along the top of the wall the top of the ceiling over to where the woman stood at the other side. It was pretty interesting. And, if, you know, I never thought about that, but sound reflects, right? Sound carries out. You know, when deaf people are like, oh, you know, they give that loud yell or in the bathroom. Someone did that to me before in the bathroom. I was like, whoa, what was that? You know, that wasn't very nice. But anyway, you know, if someone yells into the corner in an elevator and in closed space and, you know, there's an echo, right? That sound bounces back and forth. Or if you're alone out in a forest and trees and mountains and you yell <laughs> out loud, you know, a yodeling, and you can hear that sound continue on for quite some time, right? I assume that's how it does, you know, the, what they do in the Swedish mountains and, you know, they yodel away and that sound bounces back and forth. Anyway, that comes from the Greek word echo, which means to sound forth. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. It has already gone out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we don't need to say anything. They echoed out their faith. So to sound forth. You could also think of a trumpet, perhaps. Now, I don't hear. I could feel the vibrations of an instrument, right? I could feel that. Have any of you ever done that before? You know, like a big tuba and that they've got that big bell at the top and, you know, maybe in a marching band that people wear this giant instrument and this big bell and the sound goes low and deep and, you know, as it goes by, you can feel the vibrations. This is what trumpets used to look like. This is what a Jewish person at this time would have thought as a trumpet. It was a ram's horn. And it would be blown and that sound would echo out. This was called a shofar. And it would make different sounds there. This would have been a Roman horn. And it has a specific name. It's called a Thessalonian. And so this was their duty to sound out. You know, they would have some kind of animal skin or whatever I don't know why but they would be dressed up a little bit and they had this big horn and they would give signals with that horn so that that would sound out what commands the soldiers were to do um, I think maybe Corsican is maybe the word for it also so these were some different trumpets that would have been made from horns or from metal, these long metal tubes. But this produced sound that would sound out, sound forth. And so again, here the verse, it says, from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. So imagine that like a trumpet, it has gone out, not only within your area, but everywhere. Your faith toward God has gone out. I 
know if I could add. The word of the Lord here from the trumpet, that the word of the Lord is going out. So in other words, the gospel, what the Lord has written, you don't hold it and keep it to yourself. You tell it. You share it. You tell other people about Jesus. That is all of our jobs. All of us are to do this job that we have received the Lord. We are saved. And so we are to tell and share it with other people. So it says, you receive the word first in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says here, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. And so verse 6, as you heard that word, you became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word. That means they were saved. They received the word. That's salvation. And once being saved with a changed life, now you transmit that word out. You send it out to transmit. I was talking with a student recently. There was a problem with the cell phone. Remember on Tuesday or Wednesday in the big AT&T outage? How many of you have an AT&T phone? Do you have that service at all? No. Well, I had that with my Cricut phone and I couldn't send any texts for a while. I think that was Tuesday maybe. Anyway, so I was talking that over with the student and I thought, you know, I send a text and I always thought it went, that signal went up to the satellite and came back down to the other uh, phone, but I found out, no, that's not how it works. All of the cell phone towers that are out there all around the world, the signal bounces from one tower to another. And so it just emits that signal. It constantly goes out. And I thought, imagine I can text my friend in South America and he gets that message instantly. That message, that signal bounces so quickly. So when I send a message, that's not a transmitter. I can send a text. Yes, if I get a text, I've received it. But the transmitter is actually the tower. That, and so imagine how many cell phone towers, how many cell phones are in the world. I think it's like 4 billion, something like that. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, there are about 9 billion people, so like maybe 4 or 5 billion phones out there. And with all this texting going on and all these signals flying back and forth all the time and these cell phone towers receive and transmit. Now there are still radio towers, right? They still do that. They send out a signal. You know, it used to be in the 1920s that when the president gave a speech, he would tune in to the radio. The deaf people just sat there not knowing what's going on, but they would tune into that radio. There would be a building somewhere with an enormous tower that would transmit that signal. So now our church, we have received the word. Amen. Absolutely. We need it. But now we need to transmit it. We need to send it out. It says, from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. It has gone out. And it's gone out not about yourselves like the Pharisees. Now, why would I mention the Pharisees? Remember, they're a religious group that they hated Jesus when he was there. The religious groups, Jesus called these people hypocrites. Jesus said, take heed that you don't do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. If you do it that way, so that people see you, then you have no reward from your Father in heaven, verse 2. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they can have glory for men. They can get the praise of people. 
that's how it would happen back then that when a religious leader did something good or delivered you know gave to the poor they'd be dressed in all their religious attire and their phylacteries and etc and they would have a horn pronounce their approaching as they get, got ready to give their money and they'd be announced and proclaimed that this is what they're doing they were boasting about themselves that's wrong when we share we should not be talking about ourselves we should be talking about Jesus Christ our Savior sharing about the good news of the Lord and his salvation And then I'll go ahead and close here just for sake of time. And so we'll finish this up next week. But this is important. When we talk about the good news of the Lord, right before Jesus ascended into heaven, he said these things. Jesus came and he spoke to them, the disciples. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so now go and make disciples of all the nations what does that mean make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and of the holy spirit teaching them to follow all the things that i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even to the end of the age so he said you go and make disciples of all okay and Jesus said, go to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to who? To every person. You don't say, well, I don't know that that person is a good person. I'm not going to like explain the gospel to this person over here. No, this person needs Jesus too. To every person, every person needs Jesus, even those who are in jail, right? Even our enemies of the United States, those in Russia, China, Iran, they need Jesus. Those who are in Africa, where there are so many turbulent government situations, they need Jesus too. The penguins in South Pole, they don't really need Jesus. No. But the people who work there in the South Pole, the scientists there, they need Jesus. Everyone everywhere needs Jesus now I know that not every country welcomes the preaching of the gospel but yet it should be our hearts desire to preach the gospel to everyone within the United States do you know how many languages are spoken here in the United States oh it's more more than that over 200 languages are spoken in the United States why is that because the world moves here you know we see people are upset about immigration and you know I agree that those there are coming without a permit that's illegal I agree with that but yet what an opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ if this person could be saved and maybe if God spoke to that person's heart that person could go back to his country and preach the gospel there what an opportunity so we have all these perspective different perspectives here that the world comes here to America we have an opportunity to preach the gospel to every person here in this area there's a mainly majority white people here a lot of Mexican as well all of them need Jesus Christ everybody here needs Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 24 we see Jesus said to them it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to who all nations beginning at Jerusalem Jesus started with his 12 apostles he said you go and you tell about repentance and the remission of sins you go and spread that news 
and you, twelve of you, are witnesses of these things. You have seen it. And now those twelve shared what they had witnessed. And we have that today in God's Word so that we can tell other people about Jesus. And Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he met with his apostles and he said to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So again, that's that trumpet sounding out. However, whatever kind of trumpet you have, is it a lousy, quiet one? Or does it sound out the gospel loud and clear that God saved us? Do you declare that so that God can save them too? In the military here, we'll go back to this image. This guy had a serious job. There were different sounds that he had to declare, or different beats that if he had to attack or retreat or to move this way or to that way, and they depended on this sound, how he told them what to do. If he said it different and told them to retreat when they were supposed to attack, ah, uh, you know, the Romans did not run away. They didn't. The Romans stayed and fought till the bitter end. That's what they usually did. And so if this soldier would have sent the wrong message, he would have been killed. He didn't do his job right. But his duty was so important that the Roman soldiers would vote on who had this job. It wasn't the officers that chose him, but fellow soldiers would vote about who is trusted enough to have this job, who is going to sound out our orders for us. Is your message being sent out clearly or obscurely? Which is it? Is Are you telling people of their need for Christ and that they need to be saved? And then one final quote, and we'll close. I like this quote here. Remember in the verse it says that you are elected by God, right? God is the one who ordains the end. The same God who ordains the end also ordains the means to the end. So in other words, the preaching of the gospel. It is God's plan for the gospel to be preached so that people can be saved. It's not the gospel that fails. The gospel is there. It is always true, but people have to share it. So I wonder, what about your families? Do you have family members who are not saved? Do you get together with friends? You go to the deaf club and you hang out and you or maybe you're getting together to play basketball or pickleball or what have you, some sort of sport. And the people that you're hanging around with, are they saved? Are you sharing the gospel with them? Or are you keeping quiet? You know, oh, so they know me as a nice person. Well, but are you sharing the gospel? What about your neighbors? Oh, they're hearing. Well, okay, but we're supposed to preach the gospel to every person. Your dog doesn't need saved, right? Your dog doesn't need saved. You love your dog and you take time with your dog, but the dog doesn't need to be saved. It is people that need to be saved. Are you telling them? And now, think of how you were saved. Were you saved because someone told the gospel to you, someone shared that with you. Maybe it was your parents or an aunt or uncle or grandparents. Maybe you went to a camp and were saved there because a preacher came and preached the gospel to you there. It's because someone had told you. And so then you say, well, my friend isn't saved and I don't know why this friend won't be saved. Well, maybe you haven't shared the gospel with that friend yet. Let's close in prayer. 
Father, help us to think of those around us who are not saved and be burdened to share the gospel with them. Help us to tell the gospel, to transmit that truth to others. And also help us to be examples to other churches. Help us to declare your works in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a few